Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Navigating Ducted and Duckless Fume Hoods, Which is Better, presented by Beth Mankemeyer, Sales Engineer. I'm Alexis Krauss of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by LabConco. For more information on our sponsor, please visit labconco.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the answer a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credit. Please click on the continuing education credit tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Beth Mankmeyer. Beth Mankmeyer is the sales engineer for chemical fume hoods at Lobconco Corporation, a leading manufacturer of laboratory ventilation equipment. Beth has presented multiple times at the American Industrial Hygiene Conference and Exposition and at TITCON. Before joining Lobconco in 2013, Beth was a business development manager at Ruskin Company where she focused on the manufacturing of louvers at the HVAC industry and architectural products. She holds degrees from the University of Kansas and University of St. Mary. Beth is a construction documents technologist certified by the Construction Specifications Institute and a LEED Green Associate. Beth, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I wanna thank you all for joining my webinar today on navigating ducted and ductless fume hoods. Um, so during today's discussion, we are going to be talking about chemical fume hoods. In other words, we're only talking about the hoods that are protecting personnel from harmful chemical fumes and vapors. These are not biological safety cabinets and they are not powder hoods. Those would actually be completely different pieces of equipment. So if you're in need of some assistance on powder or biological hoods, just email me and I can get you to the application specialist that covers those products. So here's our map of what we're actually gonna be talking about today. Under the umbrella term fume hoods, we have ducted and ductless hoods, and we're going to be exploring the different types of hoods that go under these terms. And one thing I do wanna mention before starting is I know that during a webinar, it's easy to listen to the first 10 minutes and be distracted and go off and answer emails and do other things. So I do want to say if you want the full benefit of this webinar, you have to stick with me to the end because I'll be discussing only ducted hoods for a bit and then only ductless and then we're going to combine them. So if you don't have time to listen to the whole webinar right now, I do suggest coming back and listening to the recording um, when you have time later. Otherwise, you may only get information on the ducted hoods if you're only listening to um, the first portion of it. Alrighty, so it's no surprise that people need training on this subject. I'm showing this slide to illustrate all the different hoods LabConco offers that fit into these two categories. So you can see it's not a small number. Each of these hoods is appropriate for a different reason, and this webinar is going to help you navigate the first step of choosing to go either ducted or ductless. So going back to our map from before, first we're going to dig into ducted hoods and explore what kind of cost you can expect with going with a ducted system and what the difference is between a remote blower and a built-in blower. And then we're gonna go and dig into ductless and filtered hoods and then look at the different definitions, which there are three, and how to choose between them. And then we're gonna come back together and compare the two options to find out which would be better in what applications and why. So what we're looking at here is the most common duct layout. It's a remote 
lower configuration. In this image, starting with the hood and moving up, we have the ductwork connection on the top of the hood, and then we have a 90 degree elbow somewhere in that duct run since the inlet to the blower is on the side. And then we have the remote blower that's located most often on the rooftop. And then a vertical outlet that has a zero pressure weather cap as the termination, what you see there. Um, so these blowers, they have to be sized for their duct run and fume hood design. The air that's going through the fume hood is completely controlled by that blower. So if you have a constant air volume system, or CAV for short, where the air being exhausted through the hood is the same regardless of the sash position, then that means the blower does not change speeds. And if you have a variable air volume system, or VAV for short, where the air being exhausted through the hood is different depending on the sash position, that means the fan either changes speeds or that there are valves in the system that open and close to modify the supply and exhaust air volume to keep that room in balance with the changing sash position. So and in this kind of configuration, one remote blower can operate more than one fume hood. That's the beauty of the remote blower configuration. You can size the blower for whatever the hood and the duct run needs. And the reason that this is the most popular installation is because all the ductwork is kept under negative pressure, meaning if you were to get a leak in the duct run somewhere between the hood and the blower, um, and let's say that ductwork goes through an occupied office space, then the fan suction will actually pull air through the leak, not allowing those harmful vapors to travel out of the leak. Um, Uh, so this is what a typical rooftop installation looks like with a remote blower. The ductwork goes into the inlet of the blower on the side, and then you have the zero pressure weather cap on top to allow the air to exhaust vertically and be taken away and diluted. So now we're going to look at the built-in blower configuration where the blower is actually sitting right on top of the fume hood pushing the air up. Um, this duct run can go directly vertical, but on this version, you can't size the blower. The blower is built in, so you need to make sure your duct run is appropriate for the blower's fan curve. These are typically louder because your fan is right on top of the fume hood, so I wouldn't recommend these for teaching labs or any lab where noise is a factor. And finally, the biggest reason against using a built-in blower configuration is that it puts all of the ductwork under positive pressure. So that entire length of duct from the fume hood up to the termination is having air pushed through it rather than being pulled in the previous example. The biggest difference is if there were to be a leak in this ductwork and that duct run were going through an occupied office space, then the contaminated air going through that ductwork would actually leak out into that space. So I always say start with the remote blower configuration and if you absolutely can't make that work and you have a short direct duct run, then go for the built-in blower. Um, this, it, this blower configuration does have its time and place. Um, so what the ideal applications are for mobile lab spaces or single story buildings with a pitched roof where it would really be difficult to install a remote blower on the rooftop. Um, and if you have a built-in blower, just make sure that you check the duct run regularly for leaks and patch them up right away. It is important to do so. So the typical costs associated with ducted systems, of course, have to do with ducting the hood out and the actual equipment and then the annual energy usage costs. Uh, the upfront costs include the hood and the ductwork and the exhaust fan um, and the extra tonnage required to air condition the air that you'll be put exhausting outside via the hood and the installation, which could mean putting holes in walls and the roof if they aren't there already. And that can be very costly. So just to put some numbers to what we're talking about, um, you can plan to spend about $10,000 on a typical fume hood assembly. And then added on to that is your infrastructure, so your blower, the ductwork, the air handling units, the installation, and this could all start at about $20,000, but 
Honestly, I've seen upwards of 50,000 for a tricky building, and then if you put sophisticated controls on your building, like a VAV system, it could be upwards of 100,000. So this number is incredibly variable. Um, these are the startup costs, and one way to lower these numbers is to use a high-performance fume hood that doesn't require as much CFM or air as a typical hood. Um, but that's a whole other topic in itself, so to keep it simple, I'll just say that the lower the CFM, the lower your upfront bill, and the lower your annual bill. Uh, so if you'd like to know more about a high, what a high-performance hood is, you can always um, email me and I'll be happy to discuss that. Uh, energy costs are going to vary also depending on where you live. So the folks in the Northeast United States have higher bills than in the Midwest. So we typically estimate $8 to $13 per CFM per year for the fume hood annual energy costs. And that's um, a fume hood operating all the time. So, so on a typical six foot hood, it would be about five to $9,000, depending on if it's a high performance and what the required phase velocity of your facility is. Uh, so if you're looking to save some money and you are using a ducted fume hood, here are some other figures that illustrate what you can do or what decisions you can make in order to lower that annual bill. So just switching to a high performance hood can reduce your air consumption by 40 to 60 percent. Uh, for larger labs with at least 10 fume hoods, you could use a variable air volume hood or VAV where the amount of air changes um, the amount of exhausted air changes as the sash goes up and down. So you can lower your air consumption by 10 to 75 percent. And you might be thinking that's a really huge um, difference in numbers, but that, that number has a really large range because in order to be effective, the sash has to be lowered on a VAV system. If it's never closed, then you never see a change in the air being exhausted. So it acts just like a constant volume hood if that sash is never moved. So that brings us to the best case scenario, using a high performance hood that is on a VAV system and has sash intelligence, which means that the hood has a motion sensor to detect a person's presence. And if the sensor doesn't detect motion, then the sash will shut and you'll reap all the benefits of the lower CFM. Uh, those can save at least 90% of the required air consumption compared to a standard fume hood operating a constant volume. So for smaller labs that have less than 10 fume hoods, uh, there are more inexpensive solutions for you that include multi-speed blowers like um, the IntelliSense blower. Uh, the, that blower can be set up with up to three different speeds. So at the end of the day, you can have a night setback option and exhaust less air at night, yet still keeping the hood under slight negative pressure to prevent backdrafting. Explosion-proof fume hoods are actually a webinar in themselves, uh, but I did want to bring them up because the bottom line is, if you need an explosion-proof hood, then it must be ducted. So just remember that and you're good to go for purposes of this webinar. So here we are, back to our map, um, and now we're going to talk about ductless hoods, and we're going to go over the definitions and the cost implications for those hoods. Um, and then stick with me and we'll go over the considerations when choosing what type of hood to use. Uh, so you might be wondering what a dinosaur has to do with ductless hoods, like what's shown in this image. So this is actually an image of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and they have a specimen curation lab directly under this dinosaur, illustrating our first reason why you might want a ductless hood. Uh, because the dinosaur wouldn't be too pretty with ductwork going through the exhibit, right? So we'll get into some more applications later, but basically these ductless hoods get their name because of a carbon filter pack located above the fume hood that cleans the air before recirculating it back to the lab. They require no ductwork whatsoever, so you might be thinking, just perfect, that sounds easy, let's do it. Well. We're going to learn about the reasons why you would and want, wouldn't want to use these in your lab. So we're going to start with the definitions given by CIFA, um, which is the Scientific Equipment and Furniture Association. 
So first was DH1 hoods, and DH does stand for ductless hood. So DH1 hoods are for nuisance vapors or non-hazardous chemistry. So these are typically smaller enclosures, and they don't have sensors as a standard item. So the way to tell when to change these filters out is by your nose. So that means you can't use anything hazardous. So these enclosures will have application-specific filters like ammonia or formaldehyde or organic vapors. Um, so typical applications for these are staining or cover slipping or anything you would really do on an open bench that might be smelly. So from LabConco, these enclosures are called the fume absorber, uh, which is the photo on the left, and the protector workstation, which is the photo on the right. And after every one of these definitions, I'm just going to give a quick recap. So in a nutshell, the DH1 is just for nuisance vapors. There isn't a sensor as a standard, and these are for applications you would do on an open bench. So on to the next one, DH2 hoods. Um, they actually do have a sensor on top of the filter stack. So it does have the safety feature of that sensor. However, once that sensor goes off, the filters need to be replaced because if you think about it, the sensor's on top of the filters and what's beyond that, it's just the lab air. So once that sensor goes off, those contaminants are entering the lab air. Um, so the DH2 enclosures also have application-specific filters, just like the DH1 hoods. Um, and since these have a sensor on top of the filters, these are best with repeatable processes when you can really tell how long the filters are going to last. So if there's a limited use application that is repeatable and you don't really need service fixtures or electrical outlets, um, then this is the perfect hood for you. You can have minimal service fixtures. You could deck mount them inside the hood, but it does take away, you know, your precious real estate inside the hood. So it's ideal for those applications that don't really need service fixtures or electrical outlets. The LabConco DH2 model is called the Paramount, which is shown in this image. So another quick rundown. These are great for repeatable processes. They have a sensor located above the filters, and they use chemical-specific filters. So that's the DH2. Then, the, finally, the third definition is the LabConco DH3 hood. It's actually a marriage of pro products between LabConco and Erlab, who's another manufacturer, using Erlab's green fume hood technology. And we refer to this as a filtered fume hood to differentiate be, because this specific product is so different from the DH1, DH2, and even the minimum requirements of DH3. Um, this hood has a sensor in between the primary and secondary filter. So when the sensor goes off, you have an entire backup filter that is the same size and efficacy as the primary filter. Uh, so size-wise, the hood and the filters are larger. Each filter is about three times the size of the DH1 or DH2 filters. So just by sheer volume, they have more carbon, and therefore these filters are going to last longer because they have greater capacity. So this hood has um, also has corner posts, so you can install service fixtures and electrical duplexes. So it's as close as you can get to being a general chemistry fume hood without ducting out. It also has a fully functioning sash that slides up and down, unlike the other enclosures that have a sash that lifts up towards the user like a hatchback. Uh, so these hoods require one type of filter, unlike the other DH families um, that, that both have the chemical specific filters. DH3 hoods, this, uh, this hood that we offer requires only one type of filter, and it's called a neutrodyne filter, um, which is the filter that Erlab offers. It's still a carbon filter, but it's activated differently and is able to filter out acids, bases, and solvents. And the final difference is the DH3 hood has a control board attached to the face, and it's basically a computer, and it tracks the sash position, fan speeds, alarms, and even the user which is based upon RFID cards that are provided with the hood. So overall, the Echo and Arrow um, 
which are the Lab Conco offerings for this hood. It's a more sophisticated enclosure, but with the sophistication comes more user responsibilities, which we'll get into in more detail. And once again, Lab Conco has two hoods that fall into this category, the Echo and the Arrow. So the quick rundown here is the DH3 is the closest thing to a general chemistry fume hood without being ducted out, since it can filter out acids, bases, and solvents at the same time, and it can house service fixtures and electrical duplexes on the corner posts. Uh, it has the sensor in the middle of the primary and secondary filter, so you have a backup for when the alarm goes off telling you your filters need to be changed. So something that actually applies to all of the types of hoods that we just learned about is that there are some bad actors when it comes to chemical compatibility with carbon filters. Um, and most importantly, these aren't chemicals that are considered extremely hazardous for the most part. It's the low molecular weight solvents that are not a good fit for carbon filtration because they all have very low filter capacities. In other words, the filters will fill up very quickly, sometimes even on the same day of use. So those chemicals are listed here, acetone, ethanol, methanol, and acetonitrile. Therefore, anytime you have a cleaning application with acetone, that's going to be thrown out of contention right away because it's just going to be too much of it to work with the filters and it'll evaporate um, and fill up the filter too quickly. But if you're working with these in limited quantities, limited volumes, or you can close the container that they are in most of the time, then it might still work. So the goal here is to limit the evaporation of these chemicals. So if you can do that, then ductless uh, may still be an option for you. And no ductless hood can capture every chemical. So before you can consider one of these hoods, you'll have to fill out a chemical assessment form to make sure that your application is compatible with the filtration. So this is always step one in the process. And it's going to ask for things like the type of handling, the chemical names, the type of containers, uh, whether it is open or closed, the dilution percentage, the temperature, the handling frequency, quantity, and duration of use. Um, so when looking at the lifetime use, take into account if an application changes, you will need to resubmit that application to the manufacturer on a new chemical assessment form to make sure that it's appropriate. And the maintenance conversation is always an important one with any type of ductless or filtered fume hood because maintenance is inevitable with these hoods. So people who are used to working with ducted hoods, um, they get used to not really having to touch anything in order to work with the hood. Uh, it's pretty much a set it and forget it type of situation. But on a ductless hood, there will be alarms. Um, and they're not typical on a ducted fume hood. So the lab personnel really needs to be properly trained on what to do in the event of an alarm. And someone at the facility or a pre-planned third party needs to be able to service the hood and perform filter changes. And also on our DH3 hood, the Echo and Arrow, there is an acid sensor change out that needs to be done every two years. So the alarm will go off and the maintenance will need to be done in order to continue to have a safe enclosure. Also, filters have a cost and a maintenance requirement. So depending on what type of ductless hood you have, the filter could range anywhere from a couple hundred bucks to about a thousand dollars each. Um, and each hood can have anywhere from two to ten filters. So this has to be a part of your cost and benefit analysis to look at filter costs based on how many times you will change them, which you'll find out with your chemical assessment results. And figuring out who at your facility will do this or will you need to outsource it. The filters may also be considered hazardous waste, so that will have to be taken into consideration as well with the cost. Um, so with a DH1 or DH2, the filters might last up to six months, with an ideal application, and with the DH3, the filters might last up to two years or maybe even longer with a truly ideal application. The costs associated with ductless hoods include the first cost, which have a very large range because the DH3 can do much more than a DH1. 
So the range for purposes of comparing with a fume hood, um, start at 10,000 and go to 30,000 for the actual hood, um, just as an estimate. Then we have the filters, which could range from 500 to 10,000 per hood, depending on the size of the hood and what kind of hood you have. So the building infrastructure, it's not going to be included since you don't have to cut any holes or install a blower on the rooftop. Um, installation may cost more for one of these hoods since uh, the filters, there are filters and modules to unpack and install and would not be included on a typical fume hood setup. So that all has to be considered. This photo here shows a palette of 16 filters. So when you're looking at the installation, keep in mind the opening of all of these individual boxes and the disposal and the organization and all of that just takes time and labor and it adds to the cost and you'll want to make sure that the different trades that are hired to install know what is in their scope so the full installation is completed some contractors will just see fume hood installation to bid and they might take that to mean placing the hood in its place and leaving and that doesn't include the whole package um, especially on the DH2 and the DH3, meaning your fume hood could be left half installed. So your an um, the good news is, though, your annual costs are going to be comprised of zero dollars in energy costs, at least from the air conditioning, since you're recycling the room air. So you really only worry about the power to plug the hood in, which is really minimal. Uh, so your real costs are the filters, which it's always the golden question, how long are my filters going to last? And you'll never be able to get a great answer until that chemical assessment form is filled out. So that's why we always say that's step one of the entire process. If you're really serious about going ductless, you need to fill out a chemical assessment form. So we estimate the filter cost to be 600 to 5,000 annually. And disposable, I'm sorry, disposal would be part of this cost as well. Um, and any other costs associated would be from maintenance, which would be the labor to perform the filter changes and the sensor changes on the DH3 and recommission the hood after the filters are changed. Um, so here are some other differences between the DH2, DH3 and versus a ducted hood. So a, typ a typical ducted hood has minimal maintenance after it's installed. The infrastructure and the remote blower might take some extra effort at the start, but once they're set, you won't need to think about them for a while. And with the ductless hood, the user has to be trained to know what to do for different error codes. And there needs to be a backup plan in place for when the filters need to be changed on a ductless hood. Then you have the maintenance of the filter change out. With a ducted hood, the user can be a little bit more lenient with the chemicals used. You don't have to worry about filling up filters or even be not being able to use certain chemicals at all. Um, the worst that can happen with a ducted fume hood is your fume hood liner will corrode and you'll have to replace your fume hood, but that won't likely happen in a quick scenario. So you'll have plenty of warning before that would need to happen. Um, you won't have to worry about your filter having breakthrough and possibly stopping the work before it's complete. As long as the blower is going, the fume hood should really be doing its job. A ducted hood can act as a laboratory exhaust to meet your minimum air changes per hour. So just like any other building, there's a minimum air change rate in a lab, which is how many times the air renews in a space. And adding a ductless hood will not contribute to this air exchange rate, and therefore that exhaust may have to come from another source, like a general room exhaust. So if your intent is to save money, look to see if your minimum air changes are met first because you may have to exhaust out anyway. So now we're going to go through different questions to consider um, while looking at both the ducted and the ductless hoods. And we'll find out by going through these questions which enclosure will be better for which application. Uh, so some of these might meet your application exactly, and it'll give you the answer of whether or not to go ducted or ductless. First, is the general application good for a ductless hood? Has the manufacturer reviewed the application and actually told you it's approved? 
Any manufacturer who offers a ductless fume hood will be able to review an application and tell you if it's approved and how long they expect the filters to last. How often do your filters need to be replaced? So once again, the manufacturer will tell you this information after you fill out your chemical assessment form. If it's a short filter life, is it even worth the cost of changing those filters out versus the installation and energy costs of your ducted fume hood? Um, you'll have to weigh that on a case-by-case -case basis. Does your room have a sufficient air gap? What this means is the, the area above the fume hood. There needs to be a three to four inch air gap above the filters. And this does include any accessory HEPA filters. So if you ever need to check if uh, height is appropriate, call the manufacturer to double check. Um, if you don't have this air gap, the air won't have the chance to recirculate in the room and um, your room air balance could be affected. So you really want to make sure that there's an air gap so that the air can recycle into the lab. Do you rent or own your space? So sometimes owners don't want you putting holes in their walls and roofs. So it's definitely something to consider if, you, um, if you're allowed to put holes for a ducted hood or if you're um, you know, pushed more into using a ductless solution because you don't have to put any holes in the walls. Do you want to vent chemical storage under the hood? So this is really an important question that gets overlooked because you can really only vent acid cabinets through a DH3 fume hood. Any other scenario would have to be a ducted hood. Meaning if you want to vent a solvent cabinet, it has to be connected to a negatively pressured duct above the fume hood. So if you have a DH1 or a DH2, you can't vent anything um, that is a solvent cabinet. So the other consideration is that any acid vented into the DH3 hood does contribute to the filters loading up. So those would have to be on the chemical assessment form as well. And here is an image of the way these cabinets vent into the fume hood. So if you're ducting out, you can vent a solvent cabinet connected to the ductwork above. And once again, this has to be negatively pressured duct. So it has to be with the remote blower setup that we saw in the very beginning of this presentation, not a built-in blower setup. And the acid cabinet on the left shows how those are vented in the fume hood with a connection through the work surface. And here we have more considerations. So first, who's gonna install the hood? If you have a ductless hood, make sure the installer scope includes more than just placing the hood on the surface. You have to tell them that they have to install the components above the hood, which includes stacking the filters and the light and the fan boxes on the DH3 hood. And that includes unpacking everything that needs to be stacked and also commissioning after it's installed. So you need to budget extra time for this and um, troubleshooting if there's any issues in the meantime. And for a ducted hood, uh, those are covered by different trades. So a mechanical contractor usually does the duct work and you might have a different trade actually put the hood in place. Um, it's, and then you might have a plumber to plumb your service fixtures into the hood. So it, it's um, all things that you wanna make sure to have covered before choosing which hood to go with. Who is going to change the filters? Will this be someone at your facility? Will this be a third party? Um, basically, you just need to plan ahead and make sure you know who it's going to be before purchasing a hood. Can the hood fit through a doorway? This goes actually for ducted or ductless, but the reason I'm specifically saying this is um, the typical DH3 is 43 inches deep, so you would need a 43 inch wide doorway to um, fit through. And they can be disassembled, but once again, that adds to installation time. So the hoods, um, the hoods are sent with everything assembled, but it can be disassembled to fit through a doorway. So make sure it can either fit or someone is there to disassemble and reassemble the hood. And here's the last slide of considerations. Um, are you aware of the maintenance that's required? And this is a common theme, but we often find people are not aware. 
and uh, and they're really unhappy when they're not aware, and we really don't like unhappy customers. We want to make sure everyone um, has the correct expectations of what they're going to get and um, and knows what they're getting into. So I really try and make this clear. Second, if you remember from before, if you need an explosion proof hood, it has to be ducted, period. Uh, there is not an explosion proof ductless hood on the market. So explosion proof always equals ducted. Is this the only hood in the lab? If so, I strongly suggest going ducted. Um, what that's going to do is contribute to the air exchange rate, and also you don't have to worry about being super careful with what you put into the hood. Um, also, think about it. Five years down the road, uh, this hood might be perfect for you, but in a couple of years, you might change up what you're doing and then find out that one of the chemicals you're working with is not compatible with a ductless or filtered fume hood, and so you have to go ducted anyway. So if this is the only hood in the lab, I, I really strongly suggest going ducted. Um, are you replacing a ducted hood and is the duct run already installed? If so, that's really one of the most difficult pieces of the installation for a ducted hood. So I suggest ducted because a huge chunk of money included with ducted hoods is the duct run installation. So you've already won half the battle. Are you relocating soon? Um, if so, you might want to consider ductless because they are obviously easier to transport to different labs. Um, there are, if you're renovating a lab, um, it's kind of a popular trend to do a temporary lab with some ductless or filtered hoods. And then when you're building um, the, your permanent lab, to integrate those ductless and filtered hoods into a ducted hood scenario. And so that way you're cutting down on the amount of air that you're having to exhaust. So don't forget you can always mix and match as well with the hoods. Um, are people in your lab educated to know what they cannot use in a specific hood? Uh, is your facility one that has a lot of turnover? If you have a stable workforce and they can be trained for the equipment, then ductless is definitely an option. If you have high turnover and it's hard to keep people educated on the equipment, um, I suggest ducted just because it is, um, you won't have all the alarms that might happen with a ductless hood. Okay, so we got through the questions and considerations. Now let's talk some pros and cons. Ductless hoods are very flexible. So if you're going to move or you want to use the hood in a different lab space um, or multiple lab spaces, ductless hoods can be moved since they aren't connected to duct work. Uh, DH2 hoods are easier to move than DH3 just because of the sheer size. Um, so make sure if you are going to move something, make sure that your doorways have the dimensions to, um, to accept that. Also, the ductless hoods are turnkey, meaning the installation is of the actual hood is easier for the most part because you basically set the hood up and then you have to set up the filters. You don't have to cut holes in any walls or roofs, and so that doesn't have an added cost for you. Um, they are portable, and they are sustainable since they use less energy. You don't have to take all the air-conditioned air out of a lab to use them and they are green. They don't send chemical fumes outside like a typical ducted fume hood. They are trapping them in a filter and it gets disposed of. Um, so now for the cons. They can be noisier than you'd like since the fan modules are right above the fume hood. Uh, maintenance is inevitable. There are limited applications that can be used with them. You can't, not every application is gonna be able to be used in a ductless hood. And um, there's a risk of chemical exposure with the DH1 and DH2, and even DH3 if you go through the backup filters. People really need to pay attention to the alarms that go off with these hoods. Um, and there has to be um, successful training in order to have the um, successful implementation in your lab. So here are the scenarios where you would absolutely want to use ducted hoods. Any specialty application with perchloric acid, acid digestion, or hydrofluoric acid use. Those will not work with a ductless or filtered hood. 
once again, if you need explosion proof construction, you have to go ducted. If you want a low maintenance hood, I'd go ducted. Um, if you're working with highly exothermic reactions that give off a lot of heat or smoke, you need to go ducted. And the rest are specific chemicals that you don't want to use, um, you know, which include mercury, insecticides, hydrogen cyanide, and the four bad actors we spoke about before, acetone, ethanol, methanol, and acetonitrile in high volumes. And here are the times when it would be completely accept acceptable to go ductless. So if you have a repeated protocol with little variation in what you're doing and what you'll be doing in the future. So always think about the future because this is a piece of capital equipment that you're going to invest a lot of money in. So it's important um, to know that it'll work for you for a while. Um, also, when installing ductwork is simply not feasible. You know, think of the dinosaur um, application before at the Denver Museum. They, they didn't have anywhere to put the ductwork. They had a lab right below the dinosaur. Um, or maybe you don't own your own space and you might be in the basement of a 15-story building. Um, if the lab already has a ductless fume hood but requires additional workspace, that's also a great application for a ductless hood because you always have the ducted hood to fall back on. If the lab works with non-hazardous chemicals or the chemicals are used in non-hazardous uh, volumes or concentrations, um, that's a great ductless application. If the lab needs to be mobile, um, the, the example of moving in the near future, it might benefit you to go ductless since it's easier to move without the connections to the building or um, you, know, you don't have to put any holes in the roof. And uh, last item is when training is available uh, and your workforce is stable and you feel comfortable with everyone knowing what to do in a ductless hood. So for the last slide, to sum up this, uh, to sum up, we have a decision, decision tree that we've been developing. Um, so you're not working with biological samples, obviously. These are just chemical fume hoods. Um, next, you don't have any specialty applications, which is, uh, which are what these parts of the decision tree are. Um, which these are the ones that are showing up are perchloric acid, acid digestion, and radioisotope. You always have to go ducted with those. And finally, to finish it off, if you're interested in saving money because you don't have to exhaust out, and if your application is appropriate for a ductless hood, then um, by all means, you can consider it. So uh, I hope you guys have all enjoyed this webinar, and thanks for sticking with me the whole time. Um, if you have any questions at all, please send them in, or um, if you have to take off, please feel free to email me. Um, at bethm at labconco.com. And uh, right now, I'll open it up to some questions. Thank you, Beth, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, how do I get a chemical assessment form? Um, well, that's a good question. There's a couple different ways to get a chemical assessment form. Um, the first is you can always email me. Um, I, my email is just bethm at labconco.com. So B-E-T-H-M like Mary at labconco.com. And I can send it out or on labconco.com, the website, you can actually fill one out um, online and submit it online. And you do need to register to have an account, but that is also a very easy way because it just gets submitted automatically and then you'll get an answer within a couple days. So. Now, Beth, our next question. On a VAV system, what stays constant? Okay, um, so on a VAV system, which to remind everyone, VAV stands for variable air volume. Um, what stays constant, uh, typically people set those systems so that the face velocity stays constant. So the feet per minute measurement, um, 
So a lot of times you'll see, you know, when the sash is fully open, you'll have the hood set to 100 feet per minute. And then if you lower it to uh, uh, 18 inch open the, over the work surface, then that would also scale down the CFM or the cubic feet per minute so that the feet per minute also equals 100 feet per minute. And then when you lower it about six inches off the work surface, it would also be, um, it would also be 100 feet per minute. So on a VAV system, the face velocity stays constant. And then on the flip side, on a constant volume system, the just like it sounds, the volume stays constant or the CFM stays constant. And Beth, why, why do you say $0 energy cost on a ductless system? It still has fans and lights that consume energy. Sure. So when we're looking at um, at a fume hood system in general, when we are looking at how much air it's pumping out, that's really the huge significant portion of your energy costs. So while you do still have fans and lights, those are very, very minimal. So we actually can round those down to zero pretty much. It'll be um, just a couple dollars a year as compared to when you're looking at the air in, that's being pumped out of the building in a ducted system, uh, that's going to be, if the hood is on all the time, you can, like we discussed in this uh, presentation, it would be about uh, at least $8 per CFM per year, uh, depending on where, where you live and what hood you have. So we do round down to $0 energy cost on the ductless system because we aren't sending any of that air outside and therefore um, we do round down for that because when you compare the two costs, the fans and the lights just, they basically consume no energy compared to, um, compared to the air that gets air conditioned and then sent outside. So we are getting some interesting questions in here. So let's see if we can maybe have time for one more. So our low flow, excuse me, are low flow fume hoods appropriate for all applications? And what is the typical inflow and exhaust CFM for Lab Conco's eight, uh, eight foot model? So, um, okay, so the first part of that question, are low flow hoods appropriate for all applications? They would be appropriate for most applications, and, um, and that's speaking in terms of actually running the hood at a lower face velocity. So, um, like for example, we have some specialty hoods at Lab Conco, like a acid digestion hood. Well, the acid digestion hood actually has the same design features as a low flow hood. However, with acid digestion, we don't recommend operating it at 60 feet per minute just because um, with acid digestion, there's typically a lot of heat involved and you wanna keep that face velocity higher in order to cool the air down inside the hood. Um, so there's situations like that for, um, you know, typical, basically, uh, typical hoods versus the specialty application hoods where you might actually have an industry standard that spells out on a specialty application hood what it needs to be operated at. So, um, you know, I think that's kind of a roundabout way to answer that question, but for general chemistry applications, absolutely low flow hoods are appropriate for all of those applications. For the specialty applications, you can use the low flow features, but you might not operate the hood actually at um, at that low, at like 60 feet per minute. Um, then the second part of that, the typical um, exhaust for the Lab Conco 8 foot model. So we actually publish, uh, if I would encourage that person to actually email me, I can get you the table because we publish six different air flows for our general chemistry hoods because they are high performance. So we would publish at a fully open sash and 18 inches open over the work surface. And at each of those points, we publish 180 and 60 feet per minute. So we have six different published points. So, um, you know, I can either email that person or if they, if, if you want to email me um, just at Beth M, like Mary, at labconco.com, then that would be, uh, that'd be fine. I can get you all that information. 
Now, Beth, what is the difference between the Echo and the Aero DH3 chemical hoods? That's a great question because the only difference is the size. All of the technology is identical. All of the filters are identical. The Arrow is 12 inches shorter and it's offered in a three foot version. And um, that three foot version is also offered in a narrower depth to fit on a 30 inch deep work surface. So the only difference is the size. Other than that, you have the same control box, same filters, um, same everything. So that's a great question. And it looks like we have no more questions. So we want to thank you again, Beth. And do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, just my final comment, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, it's always better to do a, a lot of research on the front end before your purchase. And, and the, with this equipment, obviously, it's not something cheap to buy. It's it's not like a pair of gloves uh, so or a box of gloves. So please reach out. I'm happy to answer any questions. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today or those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, LabConco, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through February of 2019. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.